Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, November 20th, and we will hear the presentation Planning for Freight Logistics and Industrial Development Lessons Learned. For content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in your questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. I'll just ask that if your question is for a particular panelist, it would help me out if you stated who it is, uh, just because we tend to get a lot of questions and it's easier for me if I don't have to try to figure out who the question goes to. Thank you. And if you have any technical issues, go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to help you out and answer those. Coming up next on your screen is the list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today's session is sponsored by APA Pennsylvania. So thanks to you for joining us today and sponsoring today's session. Coming up next on your screen, is a list of our upcoming webcasts. This is it for 2020. Um, head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcasts to register for these sessions. Believe it or not, we're already scheduling sessions for 2021, so be sure to keep a lookout for those in the coming weeks. And this session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. For those of you that need to log your AICP credits, head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can search either by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Be sure to like us on Facebook, just head over to Facebook and search planning webcast series and we'll pop up. Uh, that's where I post any immediate information. If we have a schedule change, date, time change, uh, when we have new webcasts available for you to register for, that's where I post that kind of information. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. We record all of our sessions and post them onto our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe and join our over 3,100 subscribers. We have over 300 videos. So be sure and do that. We'll also have a PDF copy of the slide decks available for you at the conclusion of today's session. Again, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. So that is the end of my housekeeping items. Again, if you have questions throughout your pre the presentations, just type those in the chat box. Make sure you say who the question is for, uh, and we will answer those at the end of the presentations during the Q&A. Um, everyone is going to go ahead and just kind of self-introduce themselves at the top of their sessions. You'll want to hear from them more than you want to hear from me. Uh, so I'm going to kick things off now with our first presenter, George Kinney. George, I am turning the controls over to you now. Well, in a second. There we go. Thank you, George. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Um, let me just pull this up. I'm um, hoping everybody can see this okay. Um, Looks good. Uh, thank you all for having us this afternoon. Um, for those of you out there, uh, my name is George Kinney. I am the planning director at South Whitehall Township in Pennsylvania. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the area, we're in the Lehigh Valley, uh, a rapidly growing um, freight hub and, and facility um, uh, location, uh, not too far from both the, the Port of uh, Philadelphia and the Port of New York, New Jersey. So. Uh, as you can imagine, we're experiencing an awful lot of growth there. Um, I My part of the presentation is actually just to kind of set up my colleagues here who are going to give you the real good stuff on, um, you know, what they're doing on the ground. My part is a little bit of an intro in that, you know, to get the good stuff on the ground, you have to do that pre-planning work, as all of us know. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, some resource uh, opportunities some places to look for things um, you know with respect to your given area you know both from a national standpoint and from a regional standpoint and also talk to you very briefly a little bit about um, some of the issues that drivers are facing uh, and some of the technology advances and disruptors that are kind of occurring as we kind of see it in our in our burgeoning region um, hopefully this will 
sure my slide is advancing here. Uh, sometimes that first slide gets stuck. Right click with your mouse and hit next. And um, you should be able to then advance normally after that. I'm not even getting a right click here, Christine. Give me one second here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so again, resources. There are so many resources out there. It's it's hard to kind of get this all into you know one one easy to kind of figure out uh, uh, idea. But there are federal. There are obviously a lot of federal resources out there when it comes to freight logistics and and industrial siting. There are state resources available, and there are certainly reg uh, regional sources available. Um, you know, some of the things, just the pictures you see on this particular slide um, show you, um, you know, where some national data is housed. The, the Move LV on the lower left is actually our local municipal planning organization here in the Lehigh Valley, which has a wealth of information as it pertains to freight movement and uh, industrial siting. Uh, and then our state is also very actively involved, obviously, um, and they've actually just updated their comprehensive freight movement plan. So these resources are all available um, you know very quickly on the federal side um, the links at the top of the slide as you can see but you can get just a plethora of information uh, anything uh, you can get some information on freight disruptions freight policy studies they have a lot of information broken down by state at the at the uh, at the national site um, performance measures regional a lot of regional studies and industry studies uh, just a, a you know great resource if you are looking for some uh, you know higher level information. The two maps below you can see um, are the 2015 uh, long haul freight traffic on the national highway system, and then that then how they anticipate that growing over the next 30 years. And you can start to really see the trend, particularly in the Northeast, of of, of ever increasing uh, freight movement and freight traffic, and for which facilities are going to be required. Um, and again, at the regional level, uh, we have a really active MPO uh, here in the Lehigh Valley uh, who has really kind of been uh, proactive because of the, the the need to be really in this region because of what's happening. Um, but the the again, the information available uh, probably maybe at your local MPO may be similar. Uh, you know, maybe maybe there's even more. So um, a lot of times you can get really good information. You know, you can start with network information. Uh, you know, i.e., average daily traffic trips. Um, you can look at, uh, we have a, a, the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission actually has it broken down farther into commodity types and movements. Those are the two bottom maps. So you can start to see what commodity, the, the tonnage of commodity that's flowing through the valley. And you can also see some of that, the, the network information on there highlighted to represent that. Um, and again, uh, the slide on the right is just another look at that kind of same information, but it's tonnage by direction. Uh, and percent of value by direction. So you can see what's coming in, what's leading. But great resources when you're starting to develop a program to address these kinds of needs for industrial siting. Um, just one more uh, look at some additional Lehigh Valley planning information uh, that includes, um, these are actually forecasts. You know, what better tool could you have than to be able to know what's coming down the road? So you can kind of see some of the graphics that have been put together to accommodate that kind of thing. Um, in Pennsylvania, we do work under uh, our land planning enabling legislation is the Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Code. Um, so, you know, and like most states, you're going to have some sort of enabling legislation that is both positive and probably and maybe has some negative um, issues when it comes to working with certain types of issues, much like the industrial movement, uh, the, the industrial uh, uses that we're doing here. Um, but certainly um, some of the MPC limitations for us or challenges, I shouldn't say limitations, I should say challenges, are that all land uses must be provided for in all municipal plans in Pennsylvania. So this is a bit problematic because if you're familiar with the Pennsylvania structure, we are a series of townships, boroughs, uh, we actually have one town and, and municipalities. Um, so when you're starting to to provide for every use in each of those jurisdictions. You can see where it's really important to do intergovernmental planning. Um, and um, it's really important to understand the impacts of you know, what you're putting where. Um, one of the things that we are able to do in, in the Commonwealth is to um, 
we can't do it at a municipal level, but certainly at a higher level, there are some offsite improvements that can be uh, requested and required of a new development, including uh, for municipalities that have a transportation impact fee in place, they can certainly do that through that impact fee program. Uh, we also have the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation also has what's called a highway occup occupation permit process or HOP which um, allows them to look off site for certain improvements if that development's located against the state route. So that's the key. Uh, you know, municipal governments in Pennsylvania don't have that same ability. So again, that can be a challenge here. Um, certainly legislation has an impact on uh, the development of a program. Uh, you know, actually uh, about a year ago uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, the legislature uh, opened up uh, four digit state routes to all full size tractor trailers where that hadn't been the case before. So you can imagine if you're familiar with Pennsylvania, the complications that could cause because a lot of our four digit state routes are very small, you know, difficult enough to get two vehicles, uh, you know, um, through side by side, let alone two tractor trailers. So there are some implications with respect to legislation and it's really something that needs to be kept up on in your state. And you can usually do that through your state DOT. Uh, motor carrier enforcement programs are, um, you know, you don't really need to know a whole lot about that as part of your, you know, part of developing a program for siting industrial structures, but it's good to understand, um, you know, uh, how those, how tractor trailers, how enforcement is carried out if, you know, if necessary for tractor trailers that aren't um, maybe uh, as up to speed as they should be on, on their, um, on, on their, um, uh, the quality of the vehicles. And um, finally, driver's hours. You know, this is a this. So this is going to segue into um, something that I think is pretty critical, and I think some of my colleagues will talk about it a little bit later. Is when you're designing and siting facilities, we really need to think about the driver. And I don't know if we do that a whole lot because right now the way the industry runs, it's kind of the facility operator and the driver is kind of an afterthought because you're typically um, they're typically not employed by the facility operator. They're typically uh, you know a, some a company that's just uh, hauling for you know by contract. So uh, motor carry enforcement uh, uh, with driver hours is really critical because a lot of times uh, the obviously the federal government limits the number of hours that a driver can drive. If they get to a facility, they're at the end of their time and they don't have a place to park that tractor trailer, they're gonna leave that facility and they're gonna find a shoulder or a rest or a, uh, uh, they're gonna try and find a rest area if they can find one, but the more likely they're gonna be looking for, you know, a, a, an old Kmart parking lot site or um, uh, like I said, a shoulder of a road somewhere. So it's, we found, we find it's pretty uh, critical here to include some sort of amenities in the facility itself to accommodate those, these, these drivers. This just kind of re-emphasizes that, that um, American Transportation Research Institute has put out a couple of, well, they do it every year. So they do a prioritization for drivers on their, their concerns. Number one is this, you know, the struggle to recruit and retain pay bonuses. But if you look at number four and five, it gets back to those driver's hours. It, you know, because of electronic logging device requirements now, they they really need to be able to pre-plan their routes and they need to be able to stay in safe and, and, and convenient locations. And you can provide that on site a lot of times. Uh, again, that gets back to the same thing. Here in South Whitehall Township, if you look at the bottom of the screen, um, you know, our, our regulations, and I'm sure Sarah and Nathan will tell you the same, require actually that facilities, um, include showers, food services, sleeping areas, and entertainment and waiting areas. Um, because, you know, they're, they're sitting there while their tractors, while their tra trailer's being unloaded. They, you know, they, it's a great time for them to be able to catch up with emails and all those other kinds of things. So providing those facilities we think is, you know, a critical uh, aspect to the siting and planning pro process. And then uh, kind of getting into the last part of my presentation, the um, there's always the black swan theory, right? So, um, you know, what 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 can we anticipate? But what do we have that what do we have no control over that we can't anticipate? And, you know, the pandemic's a perfect example of kind of a black swan. So it was, you know, something that nobody expected. And then how do you react to that? And how do you how do you um, process what you've learned through those through those uh, episodes and and make that constructive moving forward. Um, so it, it kind of leads into this 
um, automated vehicle technology that I think sure a lot of you are seeing now. Um, you know, Pennsylvania is actually a uh, actually has two test two proving grounds for automated vehicle technology and advancement. Um, but what you know, what impact will that have on the uh, industry of um, the, the warehouse, the logistic industry, as these things continue to develop? You know, are we going to see reduced accidents? Uh, are we going to see uh, increased congestion or reduced congestion? These are things that just need to be considered as you're looking to develop, a, you know, to develop a program. And finally, this also just builds on that same uh, that same concept. You know, we're we're moving we're moving product and producing product in in new ways today. Um, you look at 3D printers and the, the drone delivery systems and all of these other things that are kind of advancing. And it, you know, how will that then affect these these industries and the facilities you're citing now? Not necessarily five years down the road, but 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. Um, so that is, um, I think, believe that was my last slide. So I want to thank everybody again for attending today. And I think at this point, uh, I will be turning it over to. Jared. Jared, do you, are you? Yep, you have I'm, uh, give me one second here. All right, great. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you, George. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Jared Souders. I'm with Hillwood. Uh, the focus of my segment of the presentation uh, is to provide a developer's perspective um, on the important aspects of what makes a Class A industrial building and uh, what features drive the design of these sites and the buildings. Um, you know, site selection is, is uh, based on you know, labor, logistics, zoning um, as well as location but once a site is selected what what makes that site uh, function as it needs to for both the generation one user and also for future users i think ultimately uh, we all want long-term tenants that have a, a long-term commitment to being employers employers in the community that we serve uh, so we need to design and approve and build these facilities with that in mind So a little bit about Hillwood. Uh, we are a national private development company. We're based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm located in the Lehigh Valley and I focus on the Northeast region. Um, we are a full service commercial, residential, industrial developer. Um, so touching all aspects of, uh, of development and community planning, uh, you know, we're used to integrating or having a blend of all these different uses. Um, which I think is, is good because it heightens our awareness of how these different uses and the way folks use developed sites um, interact and, and blend. Um, a great example of, of uh, development that touches all three aspects um, of uses is our Alliance brand. Um, so we have three Alliance sites. We have one in Texas, one in Florida, one in California. Uh, really successful development projects. This is just a little snapshot of, of our Alliance um, site, but uh, you know, one of the fastest growing areas of the nation. Hey Jared, I'm just gonna interrupt you. Um, it doesn't look like your slide advanced. Maybe, I don't know if it's just me. Oh. Uh, I'm still seeing your first slide. There we go. It's up now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yep, there we go. Um, so this is Alliance, this is our Alliance site. Um, this, uh, this was a great project, kind of gives you some of the statistics of, of how well uh, this site's developed, obviously multi-phase, but um, it's a good blend of, of, like I said, all three use groups. Um, so moving forward to, to kind of where I'm at now, um, my focus at Hillwood, like I said, is Northeast region focusing on industrial development. Um, this slide gives you a perspective of uh, what we've a robust development uh, pipeline and what we've developed here in the Northeast region. As I said, we're national, uh, so we're pretty much blanketed across the country. Um, and uh, 
prior to being at Hillwood this past January, I came from uh, Liberty Property Trust, which is a uh, regional REIT. Um, at Liberty, we developed uh, about 21 million square feet of industrial development uh, right here in Eastern Pennsylvania. As many of you know, Eastern PA is it's considered probably one of the top five industrial markets in the country. Um, so I feel like this, some of these statistics and, and some of these slides will provide a, a pretty good cross section of what you might see across the country. Um, at Liberty, we did a, a really in-depth sur survey to understand our users and, and how do they utilize our buildings. Um, and a lot was learned about not just how, what goes on inside the building, but the locality of their supply chain management and also um, what their employee base may look like. So uh, of our 21 million square feet that we had in Eastern Pennsylvania, you can see 56% in the Lehigh Valley was manufacturing or, or um, either manufacturing or supporting in manufacturing, and 37% was logistics, 7% e-commerce. Uh, Central PA was a little bit uh, heavier on logistics and e-commerce, but still 40% manufacturing. So that could be um, manufacturing support or manufacturing actually manufacturing or assembly happening inside the building. Um, so kind of break some uh, misconceptions about what may be happening in, in all the industrial buildings that you see as you're driving by. They're big boxes, but what's happening inside the box? So this is just kind of a, a list of some of the activities that our tenants, um, what's going on inside the box from manufacturing chassis and axles for commercial truck plant, uh, commercial furniture assembly, manufacturing HVAC components, uh, on-demand printing, manufacturing corrugated packaging, um, manufacturing pet food cans for a, uh, a pet food um, for a pet food company. You know the cans are manufactured off-site across the street of one of our buildings. Manufacturing residential doors. You know the list goes on and on, uh, but. There's also there's all, uh, often multiple uses happening in the same facility. Um, you know, we have facilities that have a, a section that may be a pharmacy or a clean room facilities where they're cleaning and screening electronic products as they go out or as they come in. Um, so just an interesting snapshot as to what, what can be happening inside an industrial building. So there's essentially two main types uh, of industrial buildings. You have cross dock buildings and you have single load buildings. There's certainly uh, infinite one-offs or build the suit type facilities um, that can look and operate a lot differently. But for, for the focus of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the two um, most common. So a cross dock building is, is a very flexible layout. It, it can easily be multi-tenanted it can operate for, as I said, manufacturing, assembly, also fulfillment, e-commerce, um, and it's, uh, it's common in greenfield areas. So what you'll see you know, often if it is e-commerce or fulfillment, it may need ex extensive parking capacity, but you can just see the general layout of a building like as, as the, as the, uh, the name um, recommends that you know, you're having cross dock, meaning you're having truck, dock doors and trailer storage on each side of the building car parking on the two ends, usually offices located in the corners of the building. Um, circulation is, in, is important in this type of building. Um, the depth of this, the dimensions of this building versus a single load vary in that a cross dock is typically 360 to 620 feet deep. Uh, maximum depth is usually uh, dictated by egress distances. Clear height of these buildings is 32 to 40 feet, deep, 40 feet tall. That would be clear height is defined in, in uh, developers and uh, brokers terms, I guess, by uh, clear height is the mac, uh, minimum height at the first bar joist, which would be uh, located outside of this green area here, which we call the speed bay. Um, column spacing seems like it'd be trivial and, and uh, maybe you just you know divide a building evenly, but I'll, as I'll get to later in the, in the slide, the activities inside the building uh, drive the column spacing, which is usually 52 to 60 feet at the loading walls and uh, 40 to 60 feet on the parallel walls. Again, that 60 foot speed bay is, is a critical component or kind of the lifeblood of this building. Uh, and I'll get into the details of why that is a little bit later in the presentation. Um, trailer storage is also, oh, sorry. 
Trailer storage, st storage is also an important attribute of these buildings. Um, industry standard is one trailer space for every one dock door. Um, and the office component in minimum of three to 7% of the overall building square foot would be dedicated to office. We've had, we've had buildings with uh, over 100,000 square feet of office and sometimes multi-storied with mezzanines. Single load building uh, looks similar. It looks like a cross, cross dock kind of cut in half. Uh, the main difference here is really on the depth of these buildings. Um, you know, 160 to 310. Uh, and that's, again, due to the movement inside the building um, with storage and, uh, and lift truck movements. But the big difference you'll see here from a circulation and also just a, a kind of a building overview your offices are usually along the non-dock side of the building and your car parking is going to wrap around all three sides. Um, these are usually smaller buildings um, and clear height can sometimes not be as important on a single load as it is on a cross dock. So, uh, so what drives the interior and exterior dimensions of an industrial building? Um, I think there's a misconception that every building, just make it as big as you possibly can and, and, and load up the doors and there's not a whole lot of science behind it. But in, in, in fact, there is a lot of science as to what drives a building. Size and most of the internal dimensions are actually driven by the size of a pallet. Uh, your typical pallet is 40 inches by 48 inches, 56 inches high. So tractor trailers, when they were designed or, or I mean, they're designed to accommodate maxing the capacity of a trailer load. So that 53 foot trailer is designed to be full of pallets, maybe not stacked depending on what the product is, but they're designed to, to, to essentially interlock so that way car cargo isn't sliding and max the capacity at 53 foot trailer. Now we move into that, what I call the speed bay. On this slide, we're calling it the staging bay. 60 feet deep. Why is that? Because it allows for the dock leveler, which is inside the, the first uh, lip or loading platform coming off the trailer to inside the building, 60 foot deep, meaning from the outside wall to that first column, you're allowing 60 foot, 14 foot for trail, uh, uh, forklift movements around the dock door, and then 43 foot for pallet queue, meaning that uh, the warehouse staff may prep what, it, what will go inside the trailer before the trailer arrives at the dock door. And that allows still for, turn, for movements of, of pallets and forklifts going perpendicular to the dock door or parallel to the dock wall to get past this, this staged area for loading of other trailers. So the, the, uh, the speed bay or, or staging area, this is really the lifeblood of the building. There's more forklift, that, forklift and, and uh, associate activity in the speed bay than anywhere else in the building. Oftentimes the slab or the concrete floor in this area is, uh, is, is gonna have a, uh, a, a, a beefier spec. There may be uh, steel fibers in this section. Um, the, uh, the pore sequence or how this, this slab is installed is, is really uh, considered. So there's a lot of activity here in this speed bay area. As we move into the building, the activities inside the building, and this is if it was just distribution uh, or logistics based and not manufacturing, because uh, that can, that can uh, that, that'll vary different, uh, very greatly from user to user. But there's a domino effect of that pallet design. Once you get inside the core of the building, the way that product is stored is typically gonna be racked. Uh, the exception of that would be heavier products like beverages or paper that are all gonna be floor loaded. Um, but the reason the clear height of the buildings and the buildings are as tall as they are is because of the racking happening inside the building. So what dictates rack layout? Uh, I mean, obviously the logistic, the, the programming or the, the storage or the managing and organization of the pallets and product inside the building is important, but ultimately the aisle width is gonna be dictated by the forklifts that they utilize. Um, there are three, three basic uh, forklift types of forklifts. One being a, what we call this. This is the CV over here to the left. 
uh, that's your traditional counterbalance forklift. So that's going to drive 10 to 12 foot aisles uh, with rack on each side, and the turning radius is what's going to is what's going to um, be the driver for the wider aisles. As we move to the right, you can see the RT. This is a uh, a narrow aisle reach, and you can see it has the retracting or or um, telescoping fork at the top. This allows you to pretty much drive down the middle of the aisle and it has a, a, a smaller turning radius. Uh, and this will allow for tighter storage, narrower aisles. Um, now, as we get to the VNA, very narrow aisle forklift or a turret truck as it's also called, now you're getting into a really narrow aisle uh, interior storage layout. Um, six feet wide, this is really gonna Kind of maximize the store the the amount of volume of storage that can happen inside the building and this is really kind of a driving force in uh, floor loads and also just how these buildings are designed and and built so form clearly follows function here um, you know we started with a pallet and now we're uh, kind of dictating how how materials are getting into the building how they're being stored i mean really a lot of the architectural components of the building uh, are already decided just based on on the on the pallet uh, that you're used to used to seeing in a warehouse. Um, so uh, you know, we're designing these buildings with a lot of different uh, potential uses in mind, and clear height is, is a requirement that we've really seen evolve a lot over the past ten or fifteen years, uh, driven by forklifts and also more importantly driven by uh, the advancements in fire protection. So the ESFR K25 sprinkler head now allows us to uh, go from a 30 foot or less uh, warehouse building that we may have seen 20 years ago, 32 foot clear uh, was the norm maybe 15 years ago. Uh, it was quickly pushed with 36 foot clear building and, and now 40 foot clear height buildings are, are pretty much becoming the norm. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen a K35 sprinkler head, um, but uh, I had the opportunity to see it at, at FM Global's uh, testing facility, and, and it's really remarkable uh, how fast a one sprinkler head within 100 square feet of a warehouse building can, can put out a fire, uh, and that's uh, based on the, the uh, hazard commodity, but um, really remarkable, and it allows for more vertical integration of, of storage. Um, so you can see going from 32 to 40 foot, excuse me, 32 to 36 foot clear, that's 20% increase in in, uh, in overall storage, and obviously then 40% as you go to another rack height or another uh, another layer of, of storage. So that's a lot of the main components inside the building, at least the ones that um, uh, the ones that that pertain to storage and logistics. Um, but what, what's happening outside the building? Um, so now that we got the pallet inside, now that, now the pallet's inside the building, now the truck has to leave, and how do we get it off the property um, while focusing on safety and efficiency? So the depth of the dock apron um, is a really critical component of the outside of the building. Um, 190 to 195 feet deep. Uh, may seem like a really like you're really stretching the pavement away from the building, um, but it allows for the safe, safety and, and, and access of two trucks passing each other and the turning movements inside uh, the truck court are, are really essential. Um, something as simple as which shoulder a truck driver backs into from can, can add 30, 30 to 40 percent longer uh, it can, it can take them 30 to 40 percent longer to back into a truck spot and it's much safer for them to back over excuse me back in in a counterclockwise direction so um, you may think that a truck can pull in any which way but circulation really um, dictates which shoulder they're going to be backing in over so as we move to layout considerations you can see here counterclockwise flow is the most efficient um, logistics movement around a building. Uh, this is a, this building here shows shows how uh, you can keep cars and trucks separate, and you can also 
move those trucks in a counterclockwise flow, separating cars and trucks and allowing for better efficiency and uh, more safer movements within within the uh, the truck court and the, the site overall. So this is an example of a, of a project um, that we're just finishing up land development, getting ready to build. But I think it's a really good example of a uh, uh, adding, making sure the, the, the attributes are uh, designed into this building that accommodates a generation one user, as well as um, you know, future users. So you'll see, um, number one, buildings designed to move in a counterclockwise direction. Um, we also have good separation between cars and trucks. Trucks don't have to drive through the car lot or cars don't have to drive through the truck lot in order to access parking. Um, you'll also see the full circulation allows for easy fire truck access in the, uh, in the event of emergency. Um, we also have adequate truck and car queuing. A lot of times you're gonna have a guard shack in a facility like this. Um, this will allow for your cars and trucks to stack well off the, pro the public road uh, as they work, through the, work their way through security. Um, this site was able to accommodate off, uh, uh, excuse me, truck trailer parking outside of the guard shack. So this allows for a queuing area that if a truck were to arrive early, uh, as George said, you, you're not having a uh, truck stacked up on the road waiting for their delivery time. They have a, a place to, uh, to, to, to park and wait, or the end user can also use this for auxiliary trailer parking. Uh, another attribute of this of this site that that I think is is really special in terms of preparing for generation two users is a internal circulation road or loop road. Um, what this does is it allows for a building to be separated or demised into a two tenant user in the future. So uh, if you ever had a user in the back and a user in the front, they can use this circulation road and 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 get back to the back get back to the call it suite B without having to drive through the front users. Uh, truck court. Um, so I think this is a really good example of a, uh, a site plan that considers all the challenges and, and also just uh, kind of best design moving forward uh, for an industrial building like this or a pair of industrial buildings. Um, so just touching on community impact of a project like this, um, you know, there, there's certainly the, the job creation piece of it. Um, this is based on a, a kind of a study we did of, of buildings are in the one to one and a half million square foot size range, um, you know, potential direct jobs of 1,000 to 1,500 direct jobs, uh, potential of direct wages of $80 million, uh, potential for indirect jobs. These would be um, jobs that are generated by support of this facility, um, 450, and uh, potential of construction jobs during the duration of construction, uh, which you know are typically almost all local uh, local folks that are in the construction industry, that can be up to 850 people for a project like this. Um, touching on the, the tax base, you have you know, four to five million of tax base on a one to uh, two million square foot building. A lot of that is, is, uh, is, is school and local taxes, um, which is a sizable contribution. And and uh, and then finally, direct investments. You know, most of these industrial projects uh, fix a lot of off-site challenges, whether it be road improvements or remedi remediation of a site that may already be challenged, and also additional infrastructure, um, whether it be uh, utilities or again road work. Um, I think these benefits. This 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 slide shows just some of the benefits that a, that a building like this can create. Um, and, and kind of show that you know, when a building is designed properly and collaboratively, uh, there can really be a great benefit for everyone. Um, that's the end of my segment. Sarah, I will uh, pass it to you. Okay. All right. I think we're ready to go. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. looks good. So um, I'm Sarah Pandel. I was planning director at Lower McKenzie Township, and Nathan following me is now the current director of um, planning at Lower McKenzie Township, um, which is 
one of the faster growing uh, communities in the state of Pennsylvania in the Lehigh Valley, which is 64 municipalities. It was number three in population. I think it still is behind Allentown and Bethlehem. So we, um, and, and at the time that uh, I was planning director, we were faced with a 700 acre uh, rezoning to industrial use. And uh, what I'm about to talk about is what we learned um, in working with Liberty Property Trust and through the process of reviewing this project and, um, and uh, working on it. So this is a 500 acre um, master plan site. It was approved uh, through zoning and conditional use. It had six warehouse pads on a private street. And one of the ideas was this is coming off of a, a rural road. It was a state road, but it was a rural road. It was really important that uh, it, it have a self-contained uh, circulation. And you'll see when we bring up the site plan that allowing for a long cul-de-sac at the end of the road to prevent backing up onto this uh, t the state road uh, was really an important feature of the, the site plan. So here it is. Uh, this is with Liberty. And uh, as you can see, this is a kind of a squiggly lined uh, property. The state road is right along here. Um, it's a state route. And uh, connected into this private roadway system, which was just a, a long cul-de-sac. So I'm bringing my mouse up along this uh, Congdon Hill Road, which is what it was named. The teardrop turnaround here and then uh, circulation to each of the six paths. Uh, the other part of the property that was um, that was dedicated to the township is a uh, hundred acres of open space, and that becomes important later on when we talk about um, some of the benefits of working with a developer on a project. So as you can see, these are fairly large um, industrial sites. This one is, is about 1.2 million square feet. This is about a million square feet. There are um, two, you know, it gets silly when you say something less than a million square feet, sort of a medium sized warehouse, but some of these are smaller warehouses, relatively speaking, that feed into this property. They're all on individual lots so that they can be uh, leased uh, to different owners or operators. And when we worked with uh, Liberty on this project, they're all spec buildings. They did not have uh, anybody in mind necessarily for uh, tenancy. They did fill up very quickly because as, as George alluded to, um, this, this use category is uh, really in demand in our area because of um, many feet, many reasons, but because it's central location on the East Coast. So um, we had to look at these without really knowing who was going to be occupying. If they were going to be solely a warehouse, or there would be manufacturing, if there was going to be an office component. We weren't really sure um, until we got to the building permit stage necessarily. One of our concerns was the, town, the trucks backing onto township or state roads. So as I said, there was that loop street that uh, prevented uh, you know backing into those roads and we also did have I can show you where it is from bringing this up the other slide up there was an emergency access coming out to um, to a nearby uh, borough this is a borough of Alberta's property line here so there you have it that's uh, one of the first phase buildings as you can see, they're all connected with sidewalks. Um, there was a high level of, of streetscape actually for an industrial uh, project with um, nice decorative streetlights, uh, streetscape landscaping, and um, also uh, extensive walkways and uh, connectivity within the, within the um, complex. One thing that we were aware of in working with Lanta, who's our local uh, transportation authority, is that many of the workers would be either carpooling or taking um, ride share. So we wanted to make sure if they were dropped off, that they would have a, a safe way to walk into the place of work. Um, so we were really concerned about the impact of this large project in our neighbor neighboring areas. Uh, what we had learned with some of our earlier industrial development and something that Jared talked about being important is making sure that uh, we provided areas for uh, trucks that are waiting and drivers that are resting. So within the 
development, we require these parking areas for truck and driver layovers. So there is a, la a driver's lounge, at least one um, in each building and, and more likely more than that since the zoning requirements is based on the number of square feet in each of the industrial buildings. So it's one driver's lounge per so many square feet. Um, something that we came up with um, in, in thinking about the types of uh, users who would be there is that we require that they add electrical hook hookups for the trucks so that their refrigerator trucks or someone who's going to be there a long time, their, their uh, engines aren't idling, which is, as you know, uh, not only an energy wasting, but it also has a noise impact on adjacent properties. And then the gate, the entry gate is set back from the entrance to prevent, to permit a sufficient stacking. So one of the earlier developments in the township caused a problem because their, their secure facility gate was set so close to the roadway that the trucks had to wait on the road and it really clogged up that roadway system. So we worked with Liberty to prevent that through the site design by pushing back the gate similar to what Jared shows you on their, uh, their uh, project in Hillwood, so that there was enough room and actually additional width in the driveway to pro provide room for waiting trucks. So here's a truck parking court with door access for the lounges. So you see the truck parks here, and then there's one of the driver's lounges. This building continues on farther and farther back. This is one of the million square foot buildings, but it gives you an idea of how that was integrated in as part of their um, site development. We were concerned about mixing of delivery and loading with employee and visitor parking. So this loop road was added to the project to separate visitor and employee parking from uh, the truck maneuvering. And that's something that uh, was shown on the site plan that Jared uh, pointed out to you in the previous presentation, is that that's an important thing to include in your development so that there's not the mixing of people arriving from work, leaving work, visitors coming and going, and trucks trying to get in and out as quickly as they can. So this is a look at the loop road that, that uh, serves that project. And again, you can see streetscape amenities um, uh, walking paths, and actually this has extensive landscaping, not the best picture of it, but the project does have a lot of a nice landscaping. We did work with the Transit Authority to plan for uh, drop-off uh, locations, so there are bus stops uh, that are coordinated with the uh, transit agency at locations that they felt were important. And the bus stops are connected to the buildings and building entrances with sidewalks. So we made sure that the building entrances for employees were well marked, well designed, and connected. And then, as you saw in the pictures earlier, the road frontage contains sidewalks and street trees, so it's comfortable and safe for pedestrians uh, to use. Uh, one of the impacts that we were concerned about, and certainly uh, residents of the township were concerned was with these larger buildings. They're 40 feet on the inside, as Jared said, but they are 50 feet and sometimes a little taller on the outside. And in a, in a rural setting, they really would stand out. So we worked um, with a developer to have some line of sight studies done and then to work with the site grading to lower the buildings in the pad and the visual simulation using berms showed that you could um, really screen the buildings with uh, these berms that are three to one because you need nothing steeper than that to allow for landscaping to hold and also layering the landscaping so that it's not just a row of trees on the top of the berm but also um, a depth of landscaping to provide uh, a nice screen some of those berms ended up being 16 feet tall in order to, to screen the building. So uh, one thing to look at is if you're considering that kind of a, a mitigation is that if you're working with a three to one slope, it's 16 feet tall, you start working out uh, three feet, you've got to realize you're going to need over 100 feet to provide that area for an effective berm. There's one of the berms, um, can't see the buildings, <laughs> because uh, that berm uh, is, is near the back, it screens the project from the, 
the development on the other side of, of the creek which bounds the property. So you can see there's um, several layers of trees. These are pretty young. They will grow up and be a pretty, a pretty good mass of uh, continuous evergreens and also using the topography uh, to help with the screening effect. Uh, another uh, lighting impact that we were concerned about because of the need for um, providing safe lighting for the trucks that are there and also depending on the hours of operation of these facilities, uh, we wanted to look closely with them at the lighting. So requiring dial down lighting and dark sky compliant fixtures, also the timing of the lighting to make sure that the lights didn't stay on beyond the time that they were necessary. Now the, again, the landscaping around the perimeter of the truck courts to cut down on the light trespass and also uh, shade trees in the parking area, not only to provide um, you know, some kind of an offset for the heat island effect, but also to um, screen and, and reduce the lighting impacts. We look for opportunities to benefit the community. So uh, this was a good partnership as we started to understand what the needs of our industrial developer is. And, and they became uh, sensitive to and interested in being good corporate citizens. We looked at opportunities um, that could be long-term benefits. So there is a, a, a right-of-way for rail siding along some of the buildings and we retained that so that if there ever was an opportunity to use rail as one of the um, modes for bringing materials in and out, it would be preserved. And in fact, two of the buildings are designed so that they could make use of rail uh, service in the future. When we talked to uh, Liberty about their site plan early on, they said, well, we're going to be putting an employee walking trail in for our employees. And they had just dedicated 100 acres to us uh, as part of their uh, development agreement. And we asked if they would consider putting that mile and a quarter trail within the township greenway and accessible to their um, to their employees and they were agreeable to do that. The cost of them was the same and the benefit to the township was another mile and a half in our uh, greenway trail system. They were very open to um, using native plants. We really worked on the stormwater to make sure that natural green uh, infrastructure was being utilized. And in fact, uh, there is a pollinator garden uh, along the entryway of this project. Um, so it's a kind of a triple bottom line. It, they, really, they really went out of their way, but they also recognized it as a cost savings in terms of maintenance, so reduced mowing. Uh, there's my husband and dog on a, the, the one mile trail, which turned out really nicely. Um, the other concern we had was trucks on local and rural roads. So we really worked with them to limit the turning movements out of the facility, uh, pork chop island and signage. Um, we posted this, they posted the signs at the facilities. So the drivers had instructions on the appropriate truck routes. We designated truck routes and prohibited streets from being uh, accessible by trucks, which is uh, quite a process in Pennsylvania. Um, there were weight restrictions on some of our bridges and um, some enforcement um, by adjacent municipalities, the boroughs where the trucks would get uh, stuck by not following those, those uh, designated routes. This is an example of some of the, the signs that were used. Um, and uh, I think that they've been pretty effective. Uh, it's, it's, as George said, you know, now trucks are allowed on almost every route in, in the state. And um, it is always a trick to try and keep them on the roads that are suitable and off of the rural and um, small village roads. But this is one way that we really found uh, could help solve that problem. I think that's it for me and I'll talk to Nathan to show how he would uh, uh, enact this at the ordinance level. Hi everybody, uh, Nathan Jones here. I am the current uh, planning director with Lower McCungee Township. I had the privilege of working with Sarah 
Um, I was brought on by her to actually do a comprehensive rezoning uh, for the township uh, uh, to do a completely an entirely new ordinance. Um, just for verification, does everybody see my screen? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I am operating off of uh, a regular phone, so my apologies. Um, so what we did was uh, we were tasked with taking um, the experience of uh, working with the developers of the Condon Hill site, where uh, some initial uh, zoning ordinance language was put in place, and not only do a comprehensive rewrite of the zoning for the entire township for all of our different uses, but also continue to examine um, the success uh, the success story of this site and, and how we could impart it into the overall ordinance. So uh, just running through that very briefly here. Uh, again, as George said at the beginning of the presentation, it's important to note in Pennsylvania, um, it, it's very important that it's considered that every municipality needs to allow for every use. So we had to kind of do um, previously uh, before I got here, but then also as we were writing the ordinance, uh, how we could address it. And uh, those six items that you can see on the screen really cover a lot of the options and, and issues that have been discussed already as far as location in the community, off-site parking, your issues, your problems, um, minimizing your traffic effects, um, screening buffering to surrounding neighborhoods or other users, uh, and then also very important as well uh, is stormwater. Uh, one thing I'd notice is our township, Lower Mukunji, uh hosts the confluence of, uh, of two regional streams into a high quality cold water watershed, which eventually makes its way to the Lehigh River, which makes its way to the Delaware River. So we're, we're part of a, we're in a very important part of a very large watershed. And as such, with our uh, growing community, um, water quality, both from the state and the DEP standard, but also our own local initiative is incredibly important. So we try to work that into every land development that we possibly can. So when you're talking about our state law in Pennsylvania that requires for all uses, one of the things that we really drilled down on and continue to do is the warehousing, logistics, and fulfillment use is, is a fairly broad term. And what we found is as everyone else has noted, uh, what what goes in the box could be considered multiple things. It could be manufacturing, it could be fulfillment, it could be storage, it could be uh, any number of items. So uh, one thing that I would urge everybody who is on the policy and ordinance uh, crafting side of this, who's watching right now, is think about your definition section and think about uh, and work with your local attorney or your solicitors if you were to improve your zoning to ensure that you try and cover as much as you can and, and think about those black swan events or uh, think about those uh, future dynamics that could potentially impact you. Um, you may have read that there have been articles about adaptively reusing larger retail sites for uh, logistics operations and smaller hubs. So when you're thinking about how you're going to put the language together, be sure that you try to cover your bases um, so that you can work proactively with everybody. Uh, and have it go within the realm of your ordinance fully. Um, I would also note that you want to establish a conditional use process. Now, um, previously working in New England, I was used to working with a special permits process, which is similar. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the conditional use process is an allowed use, but it does allow for the, uh, the, the uh, authority of the township, whether it's a supervisor or a commissioner body, uh, to hold a public hearing and impose conditions on a use um, that would allow for residents who abut um, or other members of the com community to come out and list their concerns or their ideas to make the uh, project better. Um, and it allows you to have that full public participation process, not just as part of a planning and land development, but also as a public hearing. So just running through a couple of these requirements, what we really did was is we took uh, and began to transpose a lot of the good work uh, that Sarah and our staff did here um, during that first development and continue to add on as part of the ordinance. So uh, we really went into ensuring that uh, spaces would be uh, set up for parking, storage, idling, so on and so forth into the ordinance. It was there already, we beefed it up. The same goes for the lounges and the restrooms facilities, the amenities, uh, the queuing and the stacking, of course, be became written into the ordinance as well, um, and, and really just taking the lessons learned from this, this 
project that turned out to be a wonderful collaboration um, and resulting in some ordinance language and even growing it further so they could try and be model ordinance, not just for our community, but others in the area. Um, we did mention, and Sarah did mention the buffers, uh, would note that uh, we were able to work with a planning consultant who was also a, an RLA, and I'll get into it in a couple of minutes here, um, but we really took the buffer concept that came from these uh, facilities and really started to, again, transpose them to how they would affect other development in the township. Uh, as we approach, uh, we're a community that's approaching more or less a build-out status. Right now, because of the pandemic, we're actually moving into 2021, seeing a lot of pressure for residential development. But we're also still seeing interest in office uh, employment, mixed flex space that could include manufacturing, logistics, and office space, um, and believe it or not, still some retail interest as well. So by taking the buffers that had really been put forth and, and you know being used to having it written into language and in trying to interpret the language as a zoning officer, as a planner, as an attorney, uh, either for an applicant or a municipality, one thing that we really did was move in the direction of visualizing it and taking it to a point where instead of trying to uh, muddle your way through the words of what the ordinance reads and the counts of how many plants are required, really show people who are coming in through the application process uh, what the will of the township would be to in include um, vegetation uh, as part of an amenity for a site, but also to assist with existing uses and proper buffering. So here you see our class C buffer standard, which was born of the buffers that were put together uh, as part of the Congdon Hill Road project. And we went together and basically sat down and, and started to try to not just quantify, but design what the best setup for evergreens and canopy trees and then ornamentals in the way of shrubs and flowering trees, grasses and perennials would be so that abutters or, or people who um, are in the view shed of a particular project uh, would have this uh, amenity to not just shield view, but also provide some aesthetic value to the area as well. And then this just shows a vertical of it. So again, showing the level of density and the expectation of the township. So at this point now, lessons learned after doing this work for some time, we can now, at, when a land development comes into the township, say that staff's recommendation is a Class E buffer um, and, and list basically what the expectation for plantings would be. And we have a Class B and a Class A buffer, which are uh, for smaller impact sites that either have smaller berms um, or different styles of planting. And, and this one particular project allowed us to really reach out and, uh, and allow for this uh, new type of design feature to be put into zoning across the township. Um, taking it a step further, again, with trying to translate the language um, and, and take the language and impart it into a design scheme for engineers and design professionals, um, we really wanted to go and show uh, this is the expectation of the township moving forward for the benefit of the community that our elected uh, and staff uh, representatives feel make projects uh, sustainable. And when we have good collaboration with applicants, um, this is good. When you have some folks who might be a little concerned about proceeding forward, if you write it in your ordinance, you, you have the ability to really utilize the visualization here, which we put into a design guidelines, a manual of design guidelines packet uh, that's an accessory, an appendix to our zoning ordinance that design professionals can see. So here you see a 3D rendering of basically everything we've talked about to date put into uh, an illustration that you can show someone when they come in for a pre-application meeting, a sketch plan, or even a preliminary plan and, and note here that there's street trees, there's public transportation stops, there's trails, there's adequate buffering, uh, adequate parking, uh, the stormwater management feature has been turned into an aesthetically pleasing and valuable portion of the site. And, and here we have this for our Orlick or light industrial uses. So this would be uh, essentially office space with manufacturing and logistics attached in smaller buildings. Uh, getting to a larger scale, uh, this is the visualization for the larger scale that we noted here. And here you can see the outdoor pad area for amenity areas in the center of the site. 
Uh, you can also see the loading dock space. And again, this generous berm that will shield buffer, uh, shield and buffer uh, both the, the view of the parking area while still making it completely functional for the user, um, but giving that visual protection as well as that sound protection for whoever might be on another portion of the land that's abutting the area. So uh, the visualization now baked into the ordinance uh, really gives staff, your local planning commission, and your elected the ability to work with applicants and, and really convey what you're trying to achieve with the development with the recognition that this use needs to be allowed in your township. And it does not have to be uh, entirely burdensome if you have a good proactive process up front uh, where you have job creation um, and development coming in as we are uh, and willing partners like Jared uh, and Liberty at the time. Um, I'd like to go back and just touch the stormwater management aspect. So our, our township is one that especially during um, heavy rain events, heavy su summer thunderstorm events, uh, winter meltdown events with heavy rain when there's already a snowpack on the ground, or most recently with uh, the remnants of Hurricane Tropical or Tropical Storm Isaias this summer, um, being where we are at in the watershed, we, we do experience both water quality issues as well as uh, flooding inundation issues from time to time, which is why um, not only is naturalization an aspect that we're looking at for water quality purposes, but it also serves from to a degree from a larger flood mitigation overall practice as well. So. From the aesthetic standpoint, really turning basins into a naturalized feature not only helps with water retention and beauty of the site, but one thing that we had begun to notice was that the traditional soldier row of conifer trees with your fence in that area over the years has led to potential illegal dumping, which is no fault of any landowner or user, it just tends to happen. Uh, maintenance issues, um, or more recently, we found harborage for wildlife, and whether that's a, a family of groundhogs or m a little bit more concerning uh, coyotes in our area in Pennsylvania. So what we have really been taking to, um, taking to task during any land development process now is how we can take the success of this project and, again, transpose it to future logistics or manufacturing uses, but also residential developments, commercial developments office developments, and that includes not just your typical uh, swales on site, but vegetated swales with tree and shrub plantings along the side of it, mixing up your grasses to allow for pollinator areas, as Sarah mentioned, or even just diverse ground cover that actually becomes a cost savings benefit for a land user. Instead of having to have a landscaping crew come out once a month, all growing season long from spring into fall, uh, you can naturalize an area and really only require one or two mows all year long. And for a very large site, uh, that's a significant savings. And these are examples of what we were talking about, about really taking the open area that comes with the development uh, for stormwater management or just because of your impervious requirements on a site and really turning it into an amenity. And, you know, we're very lucky we have the Wildlands Conservancy that, that serves the Commonwealth as a whole, but they are centered right here in the Lehigh Valley. They partner with us regularly on naturalization of stream banks um, and other areas in the community. So this is actually, uh, I do believe that this is at a golf course, if I can remember correctly, but this is a water feature that has a naturalized meadow around it. Uh, this is a open field area that otherwise could just be uh, a traditional landscapers mix uh, that needs to be mowed every week and it's been turned into not only a, a wildflower meadow but also as you can see there the bird box is there so again there's cost savings there's aesthetic value there's community benefit and there's stormwater benefit features uh, a naturalized area like this purifies water and sheet flow as it makes its way to the creeks and streams so uh, again having that partnership to be able to do this and then baking it into your ordinance uh, creates a win-win situation for everybody. And this is just one last view of a similar eye, uh, of a similar um, area where you can see milkweed and coneflower in the area. So uh, it, just in quick closing, by taking uh, this great uh, project and, and really um, beefing up our ordinance uh, beyond some of the great changes that were made before we did the rewrite, we've been able to really take the, the great parts of this project 
and bring it to uh, commercial development, bring it to residential development, and other office development in the township. Um, so with that, uh, that I, I'd hand it back over to Sarah because uh, there's actually some very interesting stuff that's uh, coming down the pike now uh, that would be very helpful as well. Okay, um, Nathan, thanks so much. And, and that just shows you how uh, we can go from the big ideas into an ordinance writing. I did want to say one thing that we both forgot to mention out here in the, the Northeast, um, requiring a snow removal equipment uh, before the trucks leave the site is really important. Real quick, um, since we put this program together a year ago for the state conference in Pennsylvania, there have been some developments and uh, what we're seeing, um, and we're just learning about it really, is that we're seeing the automated and rack supported warehouses as a game changer, and it's being proposed in a couple of places in our area. Um, so an automated warehouse uh, uses robots and automated guided vehicles to retrieve and store products. Um, so so uh, Jared showed you the aisle widths and the dimensions of the interior of a warehouse based a lot on on the pallet size and and the um, the, the means of uh, moving them around. Well, uh, with using automated um, uh, facilities, whether they're robots or, or some kind of a specialized um, uh, mover, they reduce the need for aisle width, so they can accommodate more um, more product, uh, need less workers and it's, it's a time saver, so quicker storage and a retrieval, and it can either complement or replace some of the warehouse workers. Uh, so that's some pictures that I was able to find online of how these could work. You can see that some of the pallets are just uh, stacked together here, and they're able to kind of feed them from the side, and, and I've even seen um, pictures where they're, they're loading from the top of these things. The other thing is a rack supported warehouse. Um, so racking acts as a structural support. Uh, so you don't need to build walls and roof and then have a racking system inside of it. The racking system itself is actually the structural portion of the of this storage area. And the walls and the, uh, the roof are supported by the racking itself. Um, they can be installed separately. Um, they can be uh, installed inside of an existing warehouse or they can be built on as an addition so that if you have um, these flexible spaces where you need a large volume of storage, but then you have other areas for shipping and handling, warehouse, um, moving things around or offices, uh, this could be an addition. And it combines the construction and storage into one system. So it doesn't need any of these columns to interrupt the interior space. And it works with automated and semi-automatic systems for inventory handling. Um, so an application could be, uh, we've seen them propose for uh, cool storage, or freezer storage, uh, maintenance, uh, climate control warehouses, uh, material storage, uh, high density dry storage, and then lumber. That's a picture of one being constructed. So you can see on the side, they're starting to put the uh, cladding onto it. But tell me if you can find a, uh, out, an, some kind of an island here. These are all just uh, racking structures that are being built as a complete building. Uh, so in terms of us trying to understand as planners uh, what the implications might be, um, you know, with a higher volume of materials and a greater sorting speed, you can imagine that there might be a higher volume of truck traffic or rail traffic um, that, that utilizes facilities. Um, and the ITE, which is what we use to estimate traffic um, when a project's being reviewed, has been revised to include more than one type of warehouse. So um, you'll see that there are different kinds of classifications now. This high cube fulfillment warehouse has a, a trips per unit figure that's much higher. If you look at what the traditional warehousing is, it's quite a bit more than um, what we would, how we've been looking at these types of facilities. And you'll see that these are based on a ground floor area and with the volume of, of the um, some of these high cube uh, structures, uh, 
you can imagine that we don't really have a handle on what the traffic would be. Uh, what what would the impact be in the workforce uh, with increased automation? Um, also, you can imagine that these uh, vertical warehouses could have a smaller footprint, so they can use a smaller site. Um, we've seen proposals in our areas for these racked buildings. It can be over 100 feet tall. Typically, our uh, zoning allows for 50 feet foot tall buildings with that clear space that Jared mentioned of 40 feet underneath the um, structure. These are quite a bit taller. And um, as I said, most of the zoning rep in our area rep uh, looks at building coverage and not the volume of the structure. So that's something that we need to think about. And then just some ideas on how to deal with the, um, the bulking requirements, the buffering, and you know, the potential visual impacts and the, the, the scale of these types of structures um, where we haven't seen them before. So this is just kind of a snapshot of things that, that we see uh, coming. We have two proposed in our area right now and um, um, not that many good, good examples to learn from at this point. Our uh, regional planning agency, Lehigh Valley Planning Commission, is studying this quite a bit, and they're finding that throughout the country there's not been a lot of work done. So stay tuned. Maybe there'll be a, a presentation uh, next year that lets us know more about it. So thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, we do have some questions, so we'll start those. Uh, folks, if you have questions, just type them in the chat box found in your webcast toolbar. Um, and if we want to go ahead and turn those webcams back on my panelists so we can see you. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, the first question, we have a couple questions here for Jared. This was a really interesting presentation, so thank you for that. Um, this question says, the port in Philadelphia handles a lot of perishables. What about cold storage warehousing? What is the market like for that? And how does the, the cost of developing cold storage compare to um, a cross stocking facility? Sure, so um, yes, with perishables, it's, it's uh, I would say location is even uh, uh, more of a driver than uh, what you would have with dry storage. Um, Southern New Jersey and the Philadelphia area uh, is, is, uh, has a lot of grocery um, and grocery stays pretty tight to the ports. We don't typically see it out into the Lehigh Valley. Um, the, as far as a cost driver, a you know, refrigeration building, there's different types. You have, you'll have a freezer building, you'll have a refrigeration building. Some buildings, the entire building may be a freezer building. Others may just have uh, cold storage and freezer components inside the building. Um, so from a land development perspective, the logistics of circulation and uh, a lot of the components we talked about, uh, I talked about on the slide, um, really remain the same as far as the vertical construction of the building. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be twice the cost of a refrigeration building, uh, depending to Sarah's point about how high the building is, is it your storage is, is uh, your internal logistics are much different. So yeah, your cost can be twice uh, for refrigeration building. That would be what I would consider the vertical cost, the, the vertical building cost. Site components are going to be about the same. Okay. Hey, Sarah, um, could you pull up your presentation again? It looks like all we're seeing is your pretty desktop background it would be helpful thank you um jared how does the number of on-site employees vary by use manufacturing e-commerce and how thank you sarah and how do you design the site to accommodate changes in that the office bathroom and parking needs sure uh, so that's a great question, and it's it, uh, one of the most challenging components, especially building speculatively. Um, as I, I think I had on the slide, and a spec building, we may factor in anywhere between 5 and 10% uh, of the building as office components, and that would be essentially a central office, and then we'll also have remote restrooms, remote truckers' lounges. So that would be the whole office components, all them, the sum of all those uh, components, maybe five to 10%. And we're doing that on a speculative basis. So once we get into, once a lease is signed, or if it becomes kind of a build the suit spec hybrid, uh, it's much easier to integrate the other office components that they may need at that time. 
Um, but we really try to design these buildings that um, they're as flexible as they possibly can be. As I mentioned, you know, first generation users, uh, obviously important, but we're trying to think ahead. So essentially, so what we may do, uh, what we do on all these buildings is the sanitary loop. So the underground plumbing, uh, the sanitary loop will go around the entire building. So anywhere that a, a user needs to add a, uh, whether it be a restroom or an office, um, the underground sanitary is already there. We'll also have a plumbing loop that wraps around the entire, the, you know, the top of the building or the perimeter of the building. Typically, you don't see offices in the core of the building because they're just more challenging to get to. Your egress is going to be more challenged. Everything's usually around the perimeter. Um, but, uh, you know, that's another preparation that even though a first generation user may have all their office in the front corner, we have the utility infrastructure or the utilities on it, within the building as a spec building to accommodate whatever they may need in the future. Um, and, and, you know, one other piece is as we go through um, even parking, for instance, you know, we're always going to meet the code minimum for parking spaces, uh, parking counts, right? But it, it, as, if a site accommodates uh, more parking, we may have it approved for uh, what we think we may need in the future and then scale it back when it comes time for permitting and construction. So that way we have the ability to expand in the future. So um, yeah, second generation users and future users are, are a real consideration as we're going through the design process and, and kind of collaborating with the municipality as well, getting their feedback about what future users may need. And I think that that's an important uh, component of the land development process. Um, you know, most buildings are built speculatively. So that conversation with uh, with the planners and, and with the planning commission, it's very important uh, to, to give everyone flexibility moving forward. The last thing anybody wants is a vacant building. We want, you know, we want users that are there long-term and, and gonna be, uh, you know, a long-term employer and a long-term tenant. And Jared, one more for you. Um... What percentage of uh, industrial sites is actually built on spec? Well, uh, that's yeah, that's that's a challenging question, only because I'm sure uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, regional considerations. Um, certain markets are it would be considered a primary market. Other markets may be considered a secondary market. So, in a primary market. Um, if I had to guess, 75 to 80 percent of buildings may be built on spec because uh, if it's built, if it's designed properly, and you know you're hitting on like the three L's, like I said before, you know, logistics, labor, and 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 connectivity, um, and and location, you're going to have a site that's that's in a proven location it's gonna get leased up and, it, and you're gonna have the right user that's gonna sign that long-term lease. Um, if you're in a, in a kind of a periphery market or a secondary market, um, then it may you may have a site that's under control and you might have to wait for a build a suit to come along uh, just because you can't have a vacant building sitting there for a year. Um, that, that really challenges, not just that site, but there'll be a, a residual impact on other on other sites in that market. You know, it, it's, it's important that sites are not sitting vacant. So um, you know, in a secondary market, it would certainly be a lot lower percentage, maybe maybe 80% is heavy, but certainly more than 50% of buildings uh, sites are built on a speculative basis, at least given the, given the current economy. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, and this is for everybody. Um, with increased residential sprawl and desire by many e-commerce companies to move fulfillment uh, closer to customers, there's a push for smaller facilities closer to town and city centers. Have you ever worked on rezoning and siting these types of micro facilities in the heart of a commercial corridor? And, or is that something you think about for potential future development? Um, Jared, why don't we start with you and then we can have everyone else kind of weigh in after that. Sure. So. Uh, I we I have not uh, developed any reuse such as you know you mentioned. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of talk about this becoming a, a mainstream trend, especially as we see retail as we know it changing so much. Um, and, and I'm sure in, in everyone's community, there's a, there's some some derelict strip centers that are just 
sitting unused and you say there has to be a better use that's just not not a good not good for anybody it doesn't help with property values it doesn't help with the constituents of the community to have a, a, a vacant uh, commercial um, strip center uh, so I think that tr I think that is going to come our way uh, it's going to be driven by the way that logistics evolve. You know, I think you're seeing more last mile, you're seeing consumer trends change dramatically that we expect goods that we ordered uh, at, you know, at lunch at, at work to be there when we get home from work. And, and I think that that trend is certainly gonna drive more, call it urban or last mile logistics. Uh, but I don't think, at least in the markets I've seen and, and folks I've talked to, we're not seeing it really uh, come to fruition yet, but I would think it has to be coming, and you know there has to be a best in there has to be a best use for for uh, a, a site that is uh, is sitting empty and, and a good redevelopment opportunity. George, what about you? Do you have any thoughts, comments? Not much to add. Uh, the the one thing I would say is uh, you know just to the south of us is obviously Philadelphia, and the MP down there is the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission and they do I think twice a year a downtown delivery symposium uh, and I know they've started to hit on um, some aspects of not just downtown delivery but facility location and management and more urban core so there, there's probably some information available at their website DDRPC um, and I'm sure you can find something good there. Thank you. Um, Nathan anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add is uh, we do foresee it. Um, in fact, I, I would note uh, unnamed folks have, have already kind of floated something similar to us at one point in time in, in one of our areas um, where we do have a vacancy. And, you know, I, I think it also ties together really well with, you know, we have to foresee or try to foresee as best as we possibly can uh, what the next step is so we can be proactive instead of reactive with how you Put your process and your ordinances together uh, the larger retailers are already doing some level of a pickup status as i'm sure everybody knows who's listening um, what we're seeing is that some of those pickups need to expand now at base uh, retail sites that are currently active the, the question then becomes is does that turn into pickup um, for some similar similar uses or similar facilities uh, in a prior retail corridor like someone had mentioned um, where we currently have a vacancy. And for us, that means, you know, doing the math on what the required number of parking spaces are going to be, the same type of queuing area that we needed to determine. So uh, stay tuned, because actually, that, that's actually something that we're working on right now to try and get ahead of with our ordinance language, because we've already been pinged on it once by a potential user. So I think it's very real. Sarah, any last comments on that? Um, well, we do have something similar um, in Lower Mukunji Township with a, with a, someone who has a warehouse and, and distribution facility for their office products, and it's in the commercial quarter. It's kind of more of an office park type of use, um, but the same principles of berming and uh, connectivity apply. The only other thought I have is what we are seeing is some of the self-storage facilities that are starting to come in. Um, and how, from a design point of view, to make them look like they fit on a main street. You know, with um, they're, they're starting to look like small office buildings. So um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how, how the circulation works and how the physical design of the building works so that it blends in more with um, a commercial context. Hey. Okay, uh, we have to wrap up. It's time to stop. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us, um, George and Jared and Sarah and Nathan, um, and to APA Pennsylvania for hosting today's session. This was really interesting. We don't talk much about this in detail, so this was great. Uh, everyone, as a reminder, we are recording the session. It will be available probably Monday up on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast Series on YouTube. And we will also have a PDF copy of these slide decks available again, probably Monday on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Make sure you like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and head over to our webcast webpage to register for our upcoming sessions. Everyone, thank you. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. And we will talk next time. Thank you. Thank you.